Why are we waiting till 40, 45, 50 to realise that imposter syndrome is a thing, we have it and we can reframe? Why, why are we, I mean, if we've got one job at school to prepare people for adulthood, this should be thought about then. How the brain works, how, you know, kind of our own biases towards ourselves needs to be taught. In all your dealings with people, is there a big kind of age or generational gap? And the reason I say that purely anecdotally, you know, people I know around my age, early 40s, it's almost you get to a point where you stop caring about what other people think. It's not important. And you almost wish you could have transplanted this mm. outlook to your 20-year-old self. Because it's like, well, what would I have been capable of if I hadn't been so worried about my appearance or what I said or all these other things? You just kind of lose some of that that weight of, of worry of what other people think. Do you notice that? Is that a common thing where people suddenly get to a certain age or maturity or life stage and just these these conversations you have with them become slightly easier? Well, I, d I don't think you ever graduate from a school of self-improvement. So that is a constant journey. But I, when I was a photographer, I used to take pictures of families, portraits, and the mum would always say, oh, no, don't put me in it, just the kids. And I <laughs> I think I did once, but my own, my inner narrative was, you know, in 10 years time, you're going to be older and fatter, right? So how you look now, you're going to look back at this and go, boy, I was hot. So let's enjoy this because in 10 years. Time... So we're always looking back and going, I've got a friend who's got a picture of herself when she was 18 on a fridge. She's 52. You're not going to look like that again, love. You haven't got a DeLorean in the garage, but she uses it to deter herself from eating biscuits. I'm like, I it, it, it's energy that I could be using to do something that actually has an impact on my life and others. So I think maybe there is a point where people realise this. If it is, it came very late for me. And if it is, why are we waiting till 40, 45, 50 to realise that imposter syndrome is a thing? We have it and we can reframe. Why, why are we, I mean, if we've got one job at school to prepare people for adulthood, this should be thought about then how the brain works, how, you know, kind of our own biases towards ourselves needs to be taught because we're getting stuck in these stories. We're believing the hype and then it takes a life, to, it takes like a middle-aged life in order to actually work it through. It's got to be a better way. Think of what we could have been doing earlier if we'd had this knowledge. Is that what's missing from the curriculum? If you could add anything in, would it be a greater awareness or emphasis on some of the things you're going to experience as you leave school and go through university and go through your young adult life because you're taught about Pythagoras but you're not really taught about what the what what you're what it's going to look like your first day at your job and how to deal with, yeah. with situations what your teenage brain can't imagine yeah and we need to look at employers for this employers are constantly going here's the list of things that your people can't do when you pass them on to us you know and we're like oh yeah we'll do more history you know i'm not saying like when i was um in doing at uni we did alternative history because the history was very kind of through a British lens, right? Very more. Britain's good, everyone else is rubbish. Um, and alternative history was Mary Seacole. <laughs> it's like a, a nurse who wasn't white, who did something amazing. And, and it was billed as alternative history, like someone had sat and made it up, or it's just a tale, but it's not true, and blah, blah. And I, and I think the whole thing is with the curriculum is that we need to look at... A, we, need to, we need to stop moaning about what... We need to measure our success, not on phonics screening checks, not on GCSE results, but what our kids are doing at 30 years old. That's how we have success. That's how we know we have a legacy, a lifetime legacy. So if we are equipping people to deal with everything that the human humanity throws at them, like change, you know, like half the jobs seven year olds are going to do, haven't even been invented yet. AI is going to change the way we live and work and then probably kill us all. So, you know, there's... The it's pointless saying, 50 years ago, this is what it was like for me, so you need to know this. No, actually, I need to be prepared to be agile. I need to be prepared to be resilient. I'd write a whole new curriculum and it would centre on these things. And when after COVID, the government put out whoever was education secretary, 47 education secretaries ago, two years ago, they put out this thing saying, well, good news, good news, we're going back to exams, GCSEs, because it's the fairest way of work, and I'm like, mm -mm, it's not the fairest way, it's the easiest way for you. Just be honest, it's not the fairest way, but it is the easiest way. The more we discover about neurodiversity, the more we discover about what's actually needed afterwards, the more we discover about big academic achievers going to a university and not being the biggest fish in a small pond anymore and having massive mental health issues. If every child at 16 gets a load of nines, 
but they've got no way of monitoring their own mental health. They don't know how to lead themselves. They can't market themselves in a job. What have we actually won? Nothing. All we're doing is churning out more of the same. It's not enough. It's not enough. It needs to be better. We need to be better. So for me, like my daughter learned about credit cards and a compound interest when she took core maths as an option at sixth form, but she spent her GCSEs doing quadratic equations. I would argue many 16 year olds will never use those words again, but everybody will have a credit card, rent to pay, budgeting, a mortgage, whatever. So can we just prioritise and actually give them so? And also the human brain, I mean, we've got to stop walking around as if we humans are a mystery and they just do stuff out of nowhere. It, 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 that's not what happens. We're very predictable. We, we predict leadership behaviours. Human behaviour is actually very predictable. You keep a cat, a rat in a cage, poke it with a stick, let it out, probably going to bite you. So all this shock horror, look at this person who's done this heinous thing. What's behind the front? You know, we're passing them from school to school. We're ex excluding people. Can't do it. And then they end up in prison. It's not that none of them have got literacy skills. I'm like, is, is there anyone else thinking that this is coincidence? And then they all go on to commit crime. And then we're all surprised and horrified. I'm like, this is not a fairy tale. It's not four legs good, two legs bad. Actually, it is that. <laughs> it's not Little Red Riding Hood and the Big Bad Wolf. This We're not living in a fairy tale. These are predictable things that we can interrupt if only we can be 10% braver. There are, I, I applaud teachers, there are great teachers out there, but we need to look at the curriculum and ask ourselves, are we doing the best we can for the generation that are going to be doing our hip replacements? I don't think we are. And how optimistic are you then, Jazz, that there is going to be the change that you, you think we need to see in that regard, in terms of changing the curriculum and introducing yeah. some subjects that are essential to a young person now in over the next 5, 10, 20 years? I, I'm totally optimistic because you can see it's already being dictated. I mean, it has to be. In order, it, it, it's it's like you can keep doing the old ways, but look at look at the, all the strikes that are going on. Look at all the people, the people who are rising up, teachers, doctors, nurses. They're the ones that put up with crap all the time. They're the last people to, because they'll just long hours, low pay, no respect. You know, they they'll just keep going. But suddenly they're saying, do you know what? Things could be better. And if they're saying that, then the other conversations are big. Also, the rise of um, opinion media and and like the not the far right. What would Donald Trump be like? The, the right, the hard right. Um, and the, the rise of this sudden. Actually, do you know what? I feel like this. It's like, ah, repressing how we feel hasn't got us very far. It's put us into silos. But actually talking about how I feel. Yes, we're at the point at the minute of shouting at each other and saying you're both wrong. But actually, we're at a point where we can have conversations. And conversation is information. Information is knowledge. Knowledge is choice. Choice is change. The whole thing is going to include challenge. It is going to be hard. But I see schools now saying we're going to serve these kids. We're going to serve our community. And if that means we can't get outstanding because we're not doing progress eight or whatever the term, whatever the things are now, we'll do that because our job is to show up for them. And that that takes bravery. That takes bravery. But I see it all the, all the time. You see schools spending money on washing machines so they can wash kids clothes. So that's nowhere in the teaching standards is that included but they'll do it because they're going to fight for the highest good of the kids so again it's back to your question of is it the government that make these big decisions or is it us it's us